Welcome back to 100 Days of Logic with Carnades.org. Today we're going to be continuing with propositional logic, looking at the second round of answers to our second set of problems on the rules of implication. This video, like our other answers videos, is going to be a little bit longer than our normal 90 second video, because I think it's pretty important to understand exactly the process of working out these problems and understand why these answers are right. With that out of the way, let's get going. If you want to take a look at the problems, they're right here. I highly suggest that you pause the video right now and you try these problems on your own, especially if you already have looked at that first round of answers and you have a sense of how we're supposed to move kind of from premises to conclusion and how those are going to be generally written in philosophy. If you've already tried them on your own, or you just want to see my answers, follow me down the rabbit hole and let's get started. So, our first argument is premise 1, not P implies Q. Premise 2, R implies not S. Premise 3, not P or R. And we want to conclude from all this, Q or not S. It should be pretty clear to anyone who is paying close attention during the last set of videos that this is a textbook example of something called constructive dilemma, where we have two implications, and we have a disjunction between the two antecedents, the two first parts of those implications. The way we're going to get there, however, first we have to conjoin those two implications. So we're going to do not P implies Q and R implies not S from premise 1, premise 2 conjunction, and this will perfectly set up constructive dilemma. So we just take premise 3, premise 4, constructive dilemma, and we get Q or not S, because constructive dilemma allows us to conclude a disjunction between those two consequence of the two implications that were conjoined. And that's how we do it. It's going to be common for you to see places where you either have a constructive dilemma set up or need to set up your own constructive dilemma. Whenever you see a couple implications or a big long phrase that has those two implications and a conjunction in the middle. Moving on. Our next question was, premise 1, P or not Q, implies R, premise 2, P or not S, implies T, and premise 3, P. And we wanted to conclude from this, R and T. Pause the video if you want to work on it in your own right now, but I'm going to plow forward. So, looking at this, it looks a little worrisome, maybe, because we don't have a Q, we don't have an S, and so we don't really have a good way to use an old-fashioned modus ponens to get to our R and our T on the other end of that implication. But if we remember, one of the cool rules that we learned was something called addition. The way the addition works is we're allowed to throw a disjunction between something we already know and anything we want. So we're going to do just that. We're going to take that P that we have in premise 3 and add on a not S. And then we're going to take a another not Q and add it onto that P with a disjunction. Both of these are done with premise 3 addition. The reason we want not S and not Q is so that we can do modus ponens on our first two premises to get R and T, which is exactly what we're going to do. Premise 6, we're going to conclude R from 1 and 5 modus ponens. Premise 7, we're going to conclude T from 2 and 4 modus ponens once again. And finally, to bring them together and get to exactly what we want in the conclusion, we're going to conclude R and T from premises 6, premise 7, conjunction. Next up is this problem. Premise 1. P implies Q and R implies P. Premise 2, Q implies P and S implies R. Premise 3, Q or S. This one's going to be a little bit tougher than the ones we've done previously. Let's take a look. So, first, we should clearly see that this is a textbook example, once again, of what we've called constructive dilemma. We have a disjunction between Q and or S, and we have at least one of our two first premises, which has Q and S in the beginning. So we're going to use constructive dilemma on 2 and 3 to get P or R. If we look carefully now, once again, we have another example of constructive dilemma. We have P or R, and our first premise has P and R in the first spots in those implications. So we'll use constructive dilemma again on premises 1 and 4 to get Q or P. Now, 
A lot of people would say, it's okay to stop at this point, because we have Q or P, and Q or P is the same thing as P or Q. In the next series, we're actually going to learn a rule of replacement that allows us to switch variables whenever you have a disjunction or a conjunction, because you're allowed to do that. However, in this case, we're, we don't have that rule yet, so we're going to do a couple more steps to show that you can actually make it from Q or P to P or Q, even without the rules of replacement. Let's go. So, we can take P implies Q from premise 1, simplification. We can also take Q implies P from premise 2, simplification, remembering we can pull out either side of a conjunction. Then, we're going to stick them together, premise 6 and premise 7, conjunction, to get P implies Q and Q implies P. And finally, we're going to do one last constructive dilemma on our Q or P and our premise 8, P implies Q and Q implies P, to get P or Q from premise 5, premise 8, constructive dilemma. Exactly the conclusion we were looking for. Like I said, that's probably some extra steps, and if you didn't do them, that's probably fine. But it's important to have the variables in the right order, because even though it works for conjunction and disjunction to switch them around, implication is not going to be that way, and it's not going to be so nice to just switching variables, right? Finally, we're going to take a look at this argument, which is going to be very difficult to do. So, I strongly encourage you, if you didn't try this problem, try it on your own, do your best on it, because there's a lot going on here, and if you can do it, it means you're really, really set and ready to go into the next set of rules. So, let's go. Premise 1 is P and Q implies R or S. Premise 2, T or U implies R or P. Premise 3, T or W implies not R, implies Q. Premise 4, R or T. Premise 5, not R and X. Wow, that's a lot. Looking at the first three premises, it should be clear that we don't really have what we need to get any of them off the ground, to do a modus ponens on any of those. If we had a T, we could do some nice additions and get the T or U and the T or W out of there and conclude the other half of those implications, but we don't have a T. We have an R or T, which isn't really what we're looking for. So we're going to focus on the second two premises, excuse me, the last two premises, R or T and not R and X. Well, what can we do? We said we were looking for a T. Well, how can we get a T out of this? Well, we notice that not R and X, we can split that apart, right? We can take off just that not R from it, because that might be useful remembering back to one of our very first rules of implication, that we can take a not R and conclude T if we have not R and R or T. Well, let's stop talking about it and just do it. So, we're going to get not R from premise 5, simplification, then we're going to get T, using premise 4, premise 6, disjunctive syllogism. Then, like we said before, we're going to take that T, we're going to add a U, premise 7 addition, and take that T and add a W, also premise 7 addition, similar to the second problem we did in this video. Now we have these nice antecedents of our implications in premises 2 and 3, so we're just going to do some modus ponens on these things. We have R or P from premise 2, premise 8 modus ponens, and we have not R implies Q from premise 3, premise 9, modus ponens. Now, we have some new things to work with. And once again, we have this nice little not R that's going to be really useful. We're going to use that not R and a disjunctive syllogism to get P from premise 6, premise 10, disjunctive syllogism. And we're going to use the not R once again to conclude Q from premise 6, premise 11, modus ponens. Now, we have P, we have Q we can finally go back and use that very first premise that we had, which is the only premise that has an S, so we're probably going to need it to get to our conclusion. We do P and Q. That's what we need for the antecedent. So we conclude P and Q from premise 12, premise 13, conjunction. We then conclude R or S from premises 1 and premise 14, modus ponens. And finally, once again using our not R in premise 6, we conclude S from premise 6, premise 15, disjunctive syllogism. Whew. Wow, that was a lot of work. I hope you followed it. So, that was the answers to the second rules of implication. If you did that well and you feel confident with that, 
Follow me and we'll move on to the rules of replacement, starting with De Morgan's Law. Watch a new video every single day for 100 days here at Carnades.org. Stay skeptical, everybody.